Hello and welcome. You're watching To The Point. Is Pakistan on the brink of something dramatic? Is Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif teetering and likely to fall? Or are the images on our screens somewhat deceptive? In part two, we try and understand what's happening across the border and how we should understand these fast-paced developments. But first, Prime Minister Modi's visit to Japan, which has clearly got off to a very good start. Is a new chapter opening in Indo-Japan relations? And is the Delhi-Tokyo link a new axis in India's foreign and development policies? That's the first discussion tonight. And now joining me to discuss Prime Minister Modi's continuing visit to Japan are two of India's former ambassadors to that country, Aftab Seth, who joins us from Tokyo, and Hemant Singh, who's with me here in studio. I'm also joined by former Foreign Secretary Kamal Sibyl and the senior writer of India today, Jyoti Malhotra. Aftab Seth, from your perspective in Tokyo, how is this visit going off? It's considered a huge success in India. Do the Japanese view it in similar terms? Well, certainly the media here has uh, looked at it in very positive terms, as far as I can see. And they are playing up uh, the fact that uh, Modi and Abe have a very good personal relationship and that they have reached an agreement across a large number of areas including doubling investment, including working more uh, steadily on rare earths uh, cooperation, on defense cooperation, on uh, naval uh, exercises, on coast guard exercises, and a wide variety of other areas. Okay. So I think uh, the Japanese are looking at it in a very positive light. There's a whole range of things that, in fact, the two prime ministers have talked about and sometimes decided about. But let's begin, Mr. Singh, with, in fact, this personal rapport between the two prime ministers. Not only did Mr. Abe greet Mr. Modi with a fairly effusive hug, but he spent a large part of Sunday with him in Kyoto, personally escorting him to the Toji Temple. How significant in diplomatic terms is those, that sort of relationship and that gesture? Well, first of all, these are two democratic leaders with a nationalist vision and they do get along very well with, with each other they have uh, met in the past uh, I had the occasion to to host uh, Chief Minister Modi then Chief Minister of Gujarat when he visited Japan in 2007 uh, since that time they have been building up on that report and I think that uh, it's clear that in terms of the scope and intensity of the programming of the visit the special courtesies which have been showered uh, on uh, Prime Minister Modi and indeed PM Abe himself spending a better part of a day in over the weekend in, in Kyoto before welcoming him in Tokyo. Uh, I think that speaks uh, volumes. Okay. They are, they definitely bond well together as two great nationalist leaders, very popular in their own countries. Okay. Constable, one of the things I noticed, and it was a particularly striking phrase in what's called the Tokyo Declaration, which was issued today, is that the countries have chosen to describe their relationship as a special strategic and global partnership. Both prime ministers alluded to that phrase, our prime minister, in fact, two or three times. How significant is the elevation of this relationship to that level, or is it just at the end of the day rhetoric? Two things. One, that uh, on the Japanese side, uh, they have uh, wanted uh, the strategic relationship to be elevated. They did not quite uh, know how it could be elevated short of uh, an alliance. And I think what they have uh, then chosen as uh, uh, the best way to describe an enhanced strategic relationship as, uh, as a special global uh, strategic relationship. However, Please keep in mind that the Russians also asked us uh, to, uh, or rather, we, the Russians wanted their relationship with India to also be projected as, as more than simply a strategic partnership because we have such strategic partnerships with so many countries and okay. therefore with the Russians we have a special and privileged strategic partnership. 
So I think uh, the fact that we have elevated this in descriptive terms is not insignificant in terms of the political intentions of both sides. Jyoti Malhotra, let's come to some of the important announcements that Mr. Modi made, both at his meeting with business leaders and then also afterwards when he was standing with the Japanese Prime Minister. He announced the setting up of what he called a special management team directly under his office to facilitate Japanese investments. It transpires that, in fact, this body will also have Japanese representation on it. Is this a way of ensuring that the 3.5 million or trillion yen promised by Japan over the next five years actually materializes and gets into Indian coffers and into the Indian Treasury? The first thing I'd like to say, Karan, is that both leaders, both Prime Minister Modi and Shinzo Abe, are clearly looking for friends across the, the Asian arc. Uh, both um, the, Japan lives in a difficult neighborhood. You have China and uh, you have Russia to the north. India, of course, we are in, in a difficult South Asian neighborhood. So I think it's interesting that both these leaders have reached across and uh, have shaken hands. But when you refer to the, to, the, um, to the committee that Prime Minister Modi has announced S that he was... Special management team. The special it. management team. Now, first of all, you know, I think it's interesting that he says that he is going to... that it will be the Prime Minister's office, which implies that he will, he will sort of supervise it. I'm just a little worried about the fact that it will be yet another very centralized sort of a, a, a committee or, or a team which again the Prime Minister will will supervise now I'm not sure if that's uh, going to it's if that's going to pan out very well but having said that perhaps his intention is a good one which primarily is that if Japan remains an economic superpower then India will hopefully benefit by that not only in terms of money the, the Japanese have promised large sums of monies even in the past we know that despite the nuclear tests in 1998, the Japanese were deeply upset, but then they revived the, the uh, overseas development assistance to India. Now, if $35 billion is coming to India from Japan, which is what the Japanese have said, I think the Prime Minister wants to keep make certain that this money is going to be used in a proper way to develop India, whether it's the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial okay. Corridor, whether it's the setting up of smart cities. But I'm just a little concerned... About the centralization. About the centralization, yeah. Astab said, from the Japanese point of view, how reassuring is it that the investment that we hope to get from Japan is going to be given this enormous high priority? A special management team is being set up directly under the Prime Minister's charge in his office. Does that give them an assurance that, in fact, the money will be used effectively and Productively. And secondly, add to that, how much hunger is there in Japan to want to invest in India? There's already a lot of Japanese investment in this country, but is there hunger to put in more money? Yes, there is um, a move, you know, in the direction of India because of rising costs in China and because of other political problems in China. There is a distinct feeling amongst the investment community in this country that India is probably a more attractive destination. Um, and having said that, there are a number of critics of uh, the, the Japanese Prime Minister within the Japanese political community about over-centralization, um, about various other defense and security related policies of his. So I'm not sure how well the uh, attempt to uh, put everything into the Prime Minister's office uh, on this side or on that side will sit with the Japanese investment community. Of course, they would like to see quick decisions. And if centralizing things in the PMO in India helps for quick decisions, they'll be happy with okay. it. But ultimately, uh, other ministries have to implement. And unless they're on board, uh, nothing will really move. You wanted to come in at that point, Ambassador Singh. I just had two points. One quick point on the raising of the profile of the uh, strategic partnership to special partnership. Uh, the, the Japanese have four distinct partnership levels. And this moves us to the third highest, which is just below the, uh, the alliance partnership level. So but it it's is still only it's third highest out of four, out of which four, means it's also second lowest. Well, no, it's the... It, it's but if it's out of four, then third out, highest is also no, second no, lowest. No, no, it's not the second. It was the second lowest. Now it's become number three. So one, now level one is partnership, strategic partnership, special strategic partnership, and then alliance partnership. So we have moved up in that sense. Second, I, I would just 
uh, like to say that uh, I don't think that this is a centralizing move to move uh, uh, certain facilitation uh, issues into the PMO. This has been done in the past. Uh, for, for a long time, it was uh, the principal secretary's job to coordinate the problems of Japanese so investors. So you're saying this will be actually welcome news to the Japanese? The, the Japanese will welcome it if it is accompanied by the other promises which the PM gave, which is India will be a place which will be wel more uh, putting up a more welcoming uh, environment for investment. Okay. And uh, uh, they will be uh, allowed special uh, industrial townships with the same facilities as SEZ. Kapil, sorry, Kamal Sibyl, let's move on. The Prime Minister also hopes to <coughs> emulate Kyoto's heritage preservation model in his own constituency, Varanasi. How much can we effectively learn from Kyoto? And how much of that is just in fact inspirational talk and maybe a little bit of talk to his own constituency? I mean, are we in a position to emulate Kyoto? No, of course not. Uh, of course not. But I think the idea is to learn from uh, the Japan uh, how they have, uh, over the years, uh, made their uh, urban environment uh, uh, so livable. Uh, the whole concept of smart cities is, is a very livable uh, environment, but not only livable, but using technology uh, to make uh, living easier and uh, the spending of uh, public money uh, more economical which means a lot of digitalization uh, of, uh, of the services and etc. Et et so it will be a huge challenge before us to be able to use uh, Japanese technology for creating smart cities because these technologies are expensive. So the municipal committees need to have a lot of money and they need a lot of subsidies uh, from the state government or from wherever it will come. So it's not as if the fact that there is an agreement that we are going to have uh, smart cities but we are in the right direction because our urban landscape is simply terrible. As Kamal Sibyl pointed out, this is directional, this is something that will be achieved not in years but maybe even decades. But on the other hand, I noticed something that the mayor of Kyoto, Daisaku Kadokawa said, that in fact it was the value of cleanliness which they learned from Buddhism that had really been at the core and heart of what they've done to Kyoto. Unfortunately, the value of cleanliness is not a value we in India appreciate at all. How do we first learn that value before we start imitating what Kyoto's done? Because that's the real challenge for Mr. Modi. I think, Karan, we have a lot to learn from Japan, clearly. But, uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, Prime Minister Modi did talk about cleanliness and, you know, sort of sanitation, toilets in his Independence Day speech. But I'd like to say something else. I think uh, Mr. Sibyl was, said something very interesting. He said that India and the former Soviet Union and then Russia after that had a very deep strategic partnership. I think for the first time, India, after that strategic partnership between India and Russia, India is leaning out, is, is sort of, is, is uh, stretching a hand out to an Asian power, which is Japan. So in a sense, there is a message there, which is that Asian countries have to come together and help us. We're not talking about China right now. That's a separate issue. And Xi Jinping will be in Delhi in a couple of weeks. But if you look at India and Japan, which actually have so much in common, there's the Buddhist sort of connection. But just imagine if you would go to Banaras next, and which is Modi's constituency, and if the Japanese, uh, not only will they, uh, not only are they happy to pour in money in Banaras, but I think we have to learn a lot of things from them. And I think the people of Banaras and the people of India are ready. We also want to okay. learn from other people. There's technology. And this is money. a clear sign of that. And, and I think so. I, I think there's a lot that we can do with the Japanese and vice versa. Afsab said one of the things that at least we in India were hoping would happen and hasn't was in fact a deal or an agreement over the Indo-nuclear and permission to use equipment supplied by Japanese manufacturers. How much of a setback, how much of a disappointment is it that that hasn't happened? Both Prime Ministers have committed themselves to, to expediting the process and they said they've given instructions to their officials to hurry it up. But that is just diplomaties, isn't it, for trying to cover up the fact that it didn't happen? Well, you know, I, uh, if I may just go back to the question of Kyoto and our learning from Kyoto and learning from Japan. We have been learning from Japan from 1905 and even before the Indian national movement has been deeply influenced by Japan. As far as the nuclear uh, arrangement is concerned, we have to be very sensitive to the nuclear allergy of the Japanese. And after the Fukushima incident of March 11, 2011, 
um, things have moved a little slowly here. So we mustn't push the Japanese uh, to reach an agreement on civil nuclear energy cooperation and push them any faster than they would like to go. Uh, I understand that for us it may seem like a setback, but it's not because if you read the agreement, it is that the officials on both sides are going to continue the discussions. They have agreed to help us enter the nuclear supplies group, the MCTR group, missile control regime uh, and, and all the other groups. So it's not that they are abandoning the whole idea of civil nuclear cooperation. It's just that they have to take the whole country along with them okay. and build a consensus within the country. Aftab, so I don't think it's a setback at all. Aftab said says this is not a setback. Secondly, he says we mustn't push the Japanese faster than they're prepared to go. But the problem is, if the reports that we are getting this evening are accurate, they actually want India to give an assurance India will never test again, which is something we find very difficult to do. We want them to accept the template of the Indo-US nuclear deal, where if there is another test, a whole year is spent in some sort of consultation and confabulation and then possibly termination. And secondly, I'm told that the Japanese also want tougher inspections of our existing nuclear facilities than we've granted to anyone at the moment. So when you say don't push the Japanese faster than they're prepared to go, then aren't you also suggesting this is not likely to ever happen unless the Japanese voluntarily give up their demand? Well, clearly some, some difficult negotiations still lie ahead. It was quite clear before the visit took place that this uh, nuclear deal was not going to be concluded, was not going to be ready for uh, signing or at least announcement during the visit. Uh, the technical issues, quote unquote, uh, I wouldn't like to go in too much detail about that because these are uh, national negotiating positions, etc. But I can, I can agree with you that, uh, in general, the the issue of going beyond the commitments which we have given to the United States into a plus situation, uh, which if, uh, Japan finds more uh, com uh, comforting, and uh, then the the, the You're suggesting the kind of issues which are there are quite major and you're suggesting we, these are difficult accommodations for india to make these accommodations are not likely to be made either but not likely to uh, be as made as far as i can see because the, the it, well from our side because the the, the question of uh, de facto signing uh, uh, ctbt through a india okay. japan uh, nuclear civil civil nuclear agreement is not going to happen constable how do you view this situation are you disappointed do you consider it a bit of a setback that in fact the nuclear deal did not happen with japan or do you take the aftab said viewpoint that this is something we need to be more sanguine about we need to accept that we can only move at the pace at which japan <coughs> wants to move because japan has special concerns because of hiroshima because of nagasaki well, before I answer the question, one very brief comment on this uh, special global partnership and all that. The important thing here is that with Russia it was easy because we have uh, commonalities with Russia in terms of how we look at the governance, international governance and the conduct of international relations. But Japan is an alliance partner of the United States. And having a global partnership, special partnership with Japan has a certain meaning which is qualitatively quite different and hence okay. its importance. Coming to the question that you are asking. Can, can, can I just interrupt and say that what you're hinting at is what you're hinting at when you make that earlier point, I'm just spelling it out for the audience, not beginning a new discussion, is that an acceptance of a global partnership with Japan, who anyway has an alliance with America, suggests that you're moving a lot closer to an American understanding and an American view of certain critical issues. That's really what you're suggesting. But move on to the substantive question about not, the nuclear deal. Not necessarily, not, not necessarily that, because you will see in the joint statement there is a question of uh, uh, Japan now be becoming a regular member of our Malabar exercises okay. with the United States. There's talk about uh, 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 trilateral uh, India, let's not, US, Japan okay. uh, dialogue to be raised possibly at the foreign minister All right. level. Let's not, so let's not get deflected from the nuclear issue. The joint statement, but coming back yeah, to the, come back to the nuclear, nuclear issue. issue. You know, they had, they had sent a representative just before Prime Minister Modi's visit to see if we could close the gap in our respective positions. But this has not happened. And it was unlikely to happen because uh, Japan, as was rightly said by him, and is demanding certain, uh, uh, certain uh, concessions by us which we simply cannot give. Even the India-US nuclear deal became such a hot potato politically. So is this for a setback? Beyond that is simply not politically yeah. possible. But, but is this therefore a I setback or are you sanguine like Aftab said? Which is it? 
I would say it's not a setback because the door is not closed. There will be in 20, 2015 another summit. If it doesn't happen then, then certainly it is a setback because this will act as a break precisely to the kind of special global partnership, strategic partnership that the two sides are building. Japan cannot have that unless it is very clear in its mind that it has to treat India as a strategic equal. Oh, well, let me very quickly put that... they are trying to negotiate the deal. Let me, let me put that point to Aftab said because you're making a very good point that in a sense is an effective counter to Aftab said's position. What you're hearing from the former foreign secretary is that if Japan is serious about a global partnership and a strategic alliance, then Japan has to start accommodating India's interests and concerns on the nuclear deal. Otherwise, it's A, contradicting itself, and B, undermining the strategic global partnership that it wants to create. How do you respond to that? Well, they are, they are creating a global and strategic partnership with us at several levels, including, uh, as Kamal said, uh, joint naval exercises between us and the Americans. So it's not that they are shutting the door on defense cooperation. They're also considering exporting defense equipment, possibly manufacturing defense equipment in India. On the nuclear issue, as I said earlier, I think we have to be sensitive to the Japanese concerns and be content to move at their pace. Okay. As Kamal said, we have another summit next year and let us see if we can't converge on positions a bit better All right. by, by next year. All right, we've got time to see whether, in fact, we can achieve some sort of consensus on this issue. Only then will you be prepared to raise the bigger question, is this undermining the belief that we have a global strategic partnership? Let's come, Jyoti Bhutta, to something else, which struck me when the Prime Minister reportedly said it. He spoke about Samudra Me Ghuspet. He spoke about old world imperialism being out of date and warning unnamed countries about it. Do you think obliquely, but nonetheless fairly clearly as far as the Japanese are concerned, he was referring to their Senkaku Island dispute with the Chinese. And in doing so, has he aligned himself clearly with Japan's stand on that issue and not China's? And finally, will that affect the Xi Jinping visit in later this month? Yes, no, and yes. Okay, the first one. Yes, I think he is alluding to the Senkaku Island dispute in the South China Seas. No, I don't think it will uh, affect the Xi Jinping visit to India. And yes, again, I think both uh, India and Japan will... I think Modi is making the point that, yes, there are a lot of issues with uh, Japan, for example, on the nuclear issue, where, uh, where the Japanese want us to, to sort of sign on the dotted line. But I think this is the reason this is such an important visit is that I think despite the fact that, and I would say that the, that the fact that we did not sign this nuclear deal is a setback because the Americans very much want to send, uh, sell nuclear reactors to India and when Modi goes to the US and they can't until they get and the they Japanese cannot clearance. until the Japanese say yes because part of those uh, companies are, are Japanese owned Hitachi in particular uh, Hitachi and uh, uh, sort of General uh, Electric and Toshiba have this uh, uh, arrangement so when Modi goes to the US in the end of September he will probably have a problem on his hands having said that I think the, un the not naming of China is very very interesting because here is an Indian Prime Minister who's willing to to come out and say openly that yes there is a problem having said that we India is a China is a neighbor of India is many times stronger than India it's an economic okay. power it's a superpower but Japan is an equal equally strong economic superpower so if India and Japan make friends then I think the Chinese also may be a little bit worried well that's the point I want to pursue with you Ambassador Singh, not only did we appear, even though Jyoti doesn't agree, to lean on the Japanese side of the Senkoku Island dispute simply by the terminology we used, mm -hmm. but also we're stepping into the breach over rare earth metals. That's something China stopped supplying. We've agreed to start supplying it. Will there be a sense in which President Xi Jinping will look at all of this and say, I wonder what's happening? No, let me just very quickly just say that we will have to bring closure to the civil nuclear deal issue in the next six, eight months okay. because but it let's cannot let's be allowed let's to linger. Let's move on from but that. But moving on to this uh, issue of uh, uh, the Prime Minister's statement that he would privilege and prioritize development over expansionism uh, in terms of India's approach and in that context talking about uh, breaches uh, of uh, 
uh, sea water, some, uh, uh, etc. This is reminiscent of what the Prime Minister said during his election campaign. He, uh, Except uh, he, he wasn't Prime to, Minister at the time. He went to Arunachal Pradesh but and he said... But he wasn't Prime Minister at the time. There's the a different thing of when you say it is no, but it's a difference, isn't it? When you say it as Prime Minister and you say it on Japanese soil, referring obliquely to a dispute that Japan has with China, well, Chinese are going to immediately understand this as India taking a particular line or a particular side well, or at least giving a side. Already said this you are saying will not affect, that, yeah. this will not affect Xi Jinping at all? Well, clearly this is something which is aimed at setting some kind of a benchmark for India. Because well, it's also aimed the at word, sending a message. It's aimed at sending Chinese. a message. What do you expect the Prime Minister to say? To well, say that's another matter. A Asian, Silence. Asian, no, Silence. Well, uh, Karan, if the Chinese understand anything, the only two it's, countries it's which power. If the Chinese yes, understand yes, anything, it's right. power. For the first time, okay. or the first time in many years, there is an Indian Prime Minister who's coming out and saying it like it is. Let me, let me bring in Kamal Sibyl, the former Foreign Secretary, on that. How will the Chinese view this? As a strong assertion by a strong Prime Minister, laying down the lines and therefore accept it because they recognize and appreciate power, or will it actually slightly sour the Xi Jinping visit? I don't think so, because you know, before the Chinese presidents and Prime Ministers have visited India, you would note that uh, they make uh, very assertive claims, territorial claims on India. And they don't think that there is any contradiction between their willingness to improve relations with India and expand it in various directions including at the global level and making very strong claims on Indian territory. Uh, so they can't be overly sensitive to what the Prime Minister indirectly said in Japan. And I'm glad he said it, that he is uh, now telling the, ja the Chinese in advance that on the issues of your territorial claims, uh, we have our own position and we are not going to yield on that position. But we would like to nevertheless have good relations with you and, and you are welcome. I think this is, this is a corrective that needed to be applied. Okay. And I'm glad that uh, Prime Minister had the courage to make this statement in Japan and send an indirect signal to China that on this issue he has sympathies with Japan. All right, Kamal Sibyl, we leave it there. My thanks to you for joining but My thanks also to Aftab Said for joining us from Tokyo and uh, staying may away. May I just add quickly? Very quickly. Karan, very quickly. Uh, may I add quickly that also in the agreement uh, Modi has agreed that North Korea is a problem. This is comfort to Japan. Right. And also, both countries have agreed that we'll develop the Northeast. This is also a comfort to us. So, looking around the direct qu question of China is the question of our agreement that North Korea's uh, missile and nuclear development is a threat to uh, Japan and that our cooperation right. in the Northeast is good for us. We should look at that in All the right. context of what he said we, on China. We, we, I'm going to have to stop you there, but those also could be interpreted in Beijing as sort of shots across the Chinese yes. bow, because each of these things can be viewed very differently when you view it from the other side. But that's obviously an interesting point on which to end, because the whole visit to Japan certainly has messages, if not repercussions, for our relationship with China. My thanks to all four of my guests for joining me.